Hi, AJ Hartley here, novelist, Shakespeare professor, fan of many things, and I wanted to talk to you today about uh, a, a Japanese TV show, which I'm sure a lot of you already know. It's called Midnight Diner, or at least that's the, the, the way that it's been um, uh, marketed in the US. In, in Japanese, it's called Shinya Shokudo. It began as a manga in uh, 2006, and was then adapted to a Japanese TV show um, over a, a span of years. I think uh, the, their first season was in like 2009, uh, and they made three, three seasons over the next five years. And there were a couple of movies made, and then um, Netflix Japan added a couple of new seasons in 2016 and 19, called Midnight Diner Tokyo Stories um, and it's been adapted into, into Chinese and, and Korean versions so it's a, a big show and as I say I'm sure a lot of you already know it so part of what I wanted to do today was if you don't know it I wanted to turn you on to it and direct you to it because I think I think it's worth watching but also for those of you who do I want to just say a few very quick simple things about why I think it's really good why I think it's worth your attention if you haven't sort of looked at it recently メニューはこれだけ。あとは勝手に注文してくれりゃ。So the premise of the show is that um, it's about a little uh, Shinjuku sort of back alley restaurant that only opens at night, hence the name Midnight Diner. Um, and, um, and it's run by this sort of enigmatic uh, chef called The Master, whose name is never revealed, I don't think it's ever mentioned, who has a scar on his face. Um, and. The premise is that he doesn't have like an extensive menu. He has a few things, uh, standard things, but he will make you whatever you want if he has the ingredients. And people will frequently bring their own ingredients so that he can make a particular dish. So, you know, um, it has that, it's some, so, somewhere between sort of Cheers, as of the American TV show T Cheers, and Kim's, Conveni Kim's Convenience, the, the Korean Canadian show um, about a, a family convenience store, um, but it's not quite. It's not really like either, and it, it, and it's not a sitcom. It's not. It, it it may some of it has sort of comic elements, but it's not a sitcom in any sense of the term. And while it has some similarities to something like Cheers, uh, that that idea of people who are united by coming to, in that case, a bar, right. Um, this is different. So it's it's an anthology show. It's a unit set show, mostly. Mostly. It looks like it could have been adapted for the stage as a sort of uh, a single um, a single set stage piece. Occasionally the show will go outside the restaurant itself, but the restaurant is the core of the story. So it's a very small, one of those little hole-in-the-wall restaurants that you can easily walk past in Tokyo. Um, basically a single sort of U-shaped counter with the little kitchen in the back where people can sit. So there's not a lot of privacy. Everybody basically has to sit at the bar, which is part of the point of the show, right? Because it's about individual people who come together and create a kind of sort of mini community. And... It's not an accident that it's set in Shinjuku. If you've if you've been to Tokyo, you'll you'll know what, what Shinjuku is like, and um, it, the the sort of red light district is not as extensive as it used to be. But you know, a, a lot of it is the sort of glitzy and and sort of the the underbelly a little bit of of Tokyo. A lot of sort of pachinko parlors and and strip clubs and hostess bars and and things like that. 
And it's interesting because the show is specifically about the people who would be around in this sort of nighttime environment. Um, and it presents them. So it's a little unconventional, right? That a lot of the, the version of Japan that gets sort of shown, particularly in the West, is the very sort of shiny um, and, uh, and polished elements of Japanese cult culture or the very sort of folk culture temples and uh, and, and traditional um, lifestyle stuff. And this is kind of neither, right? This is the sort of slightly seedy um, side of ordinary contemporary life in, in Tokyo presented without judgment, right? And I think this is kind of key, that, that it's a very accepting and compassionate show, right? And the people who come to this place are, you know, the hostesses from the bars and dancers and strippers and their fans, salarymen, yakuza, gangsters, drag queens, wannabe singers and actors, manga artists, musicians, cooks, and then also sort of divorcees, the, the single and often isolated men and women who are looking for friendship and connection in the city. And they come to this little place and they form a kind of a shifting community of people who are sort of on the margins of society or feel like they're on the margins of society. And often they're people whose lives have been limited by past choices or circumstances they can't control. And most of them are living in ways that they probably didn't intend, right? Not a version of adulthood that they would have aspired to as children, you know? Um, though this is, you know, presented as a, a simple fact of life, one which I think a lot of the audience can probably relate to. We all sometimes feel uh, sort of out of place or passed over or ignored or faced with regrets, things that didn't quite work out the way that we hoped they would. And the show welcomes these these feelings, these these people, and treats them with, with kindness, takes them seriously. So Midnight Dine is a kind of anthology show in which each episode is anchored by the master, the, the, the chef um, who runs the restaurant and is its only employee. And he sort of observing the life of a particular customer. Usually it's one or two per episode, uh, sometimes serving as a, a sounding board for their problems and their issues, issues though it's, it's done delicately allowing the story to unfold at the pace of the character. It's not a, he's not a shrink or a fixer. It's not a, um, a sort of what's the weekly problem and now I'm going to solve it. It doesn't work like that. So he's, you know, a listener and he, he rarely volunteers advice. And when he does, it's presented very um, cautiously. So it, it allows us, the show allows us to be present in a kind of non-intrusive way accepting things as they are and understanding that there often isn't an easy solution, but we're sort of welcomed into this little community and into the lives of these ordinary people who in many ways look a little like us, you know, and it's very subtle. It's not, it's not preachy. It's often funny and it's often sad. And that combination, you know, which sounds like a paradox and wouldn't work for a sitcom, but it's, you know, because it's like, life right where the sort of tonality is is multiple um and um and, and rooted in that sort of ob observation of ordinary people's lives you know. above all it's anchored by food and this is i think one of the differences from something like cheers cheers is in a bar but the bar is just a place where people come and their stories sort of interconnect but the fact that this is a tiny little restaurant is really important because food is so important for the show. And it's a sort of, it's a love letter to food. We even get sort of recipe tips. I'll talk about that in a second. So it's food as a manifestation of personal taste, the tastes of the, of the customers and the, and the people who, who work there. It's food as 
discovery, it's food as the sharing of experience. But most importantly, especially, I think it's food as memory, where the food provides a link to the past, a, a sort of way of, of anchoring us in a present which often feels um, disconnecting and disconnected, right? especially in a modern city, especially in a huge sprawling city like Tokyo. You know, the, 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 the food of our past, the food that we grew up with, is something that we come back to. And the show often hinges on people seeking out a particular dish from their childhood, right? Something that connects them to, to better times or reminds them of who they are, right? One of the things about present day Tokyo is that it tends to sort of suppress, um, I don't, I'm not going to say individuality, but it, it enforces a kind of communal experience and communal identity. And there are good things about that, but it does tend to sort of squeeze out the the idiosyncrasy and the individualism of our own personal experience. And so you feel like these people come to this little diner often in quest of something that makes them special, right? Something out of their own past. The the the, um, the, the vastness of the, of the city forces this sort of anonymity onto the people who live there. But through the meals of their childhood, their family recipes or ingredients which can only be found in a certain place, they, they reclaim a sense of who they are or who they were and their own uniqueness. And without wanting to overstate it, I think Midnight Diner is about the search for meaning in the sort of prepackaged, one size fits all, relentless uniformity of modern life. And so I think it has a very particular Japanese edge, right? Um, in that sense that, that, that more than, than a lot of Western societies, there is a sort of the, the value of, of, of sameness, the values of, of conformity, um, which has you know, a lot of positive things to it, but, but also can make you feel lost and, and um, unimportant. And, and, we, and the people in the show, in their lives and in the food that they eat are looking for some version of, of the thing that they particularly like or connects to them or makes them feel special. So um, it's also about food as love. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but, but I think, um, it, you know, food is obviously literally what gives us life, but it's also about, you know, the people who shaped us growing up, right? The things that they gave us. And the impulse to share that with others, one of the, the sort of common themes of the show is unlikely people connecting over a favorite dish. Though that is, of course, not always enough to hold them together, right? There's often a sort of poignancy and sadness to the, the, to the, uh, to the various episodes within the show. It's not just that the show is tonally varied. Some of it is very upbeat or comic or happy, and some of it's serious and tragic. It's the, the work of the show is done with a very light touch. It's often very quiet. There's not a lot of intrusive background music or any of that kind of stuff. Um, and and in, in, in theatrical terms, the scenes are allowed to breathe, right? That... that um, Unlike a lot of very dialogue-driven uh, TV in the West, where everything is a, can be a little on the nose, people express their feelings a little too perfectly, right, for ordinary life. And this, you know, feelings and ideas are allowed to emerge out of tiny little moments and gestures and silences. Um, so... Uh, you know the, the the so the the lightness of that touch really appeals to me as a as a theatre person, and sometimes it it gets to that sort of profundity. You know, um, not just in the sense that you know so romances go awry, say, but the kind of disappointment and failure that throws entire lives into genuine hopelessness. T tiny little things, which feel like it they they lead to to. Uh, flashes of insight and disappointment that, that radiate out from these tiny little specifics and become much, much larger in their implications. But 
And, and I was thinking, actually, it reminds me of something like Joyce's Dubliners, those little, where each of those short stories has a sort of epiphany embedded in it out of these tiny, mundane, ordinary details. You get this flash of insight. And frequently it's a sort of, you know, a, a depressing realization about the nature of, of the world and people and life, right? Um, but one of the things about the show that I really like is that the overall tenor still manages to stay kind of upbeat because there's always hope. There's always the possibility of, of connection. And um, the show is like the set and the meals. It's small, it's delicately focused on little details, but they are loaded with, with significance, right? So these the, the lives of these people are, are anchored by um, sort of small things which are paradoxically vast and sweeping because they, they mark profound change for the individuals involved. And the episodes will center on those little moments of, of realization or shift, right? Um, and uh, one of the other things I like is in terms of the food thing, most episodes end with this sort of slightly meta breaking of the fourth wall, that the actors still in character, though slightly outside the story that they just performed, will address the camera directly and offer little cooking tips related to the dish, which was central to the episode. It's a, char it's a charming device, which draws the audience into the community in the same way that the master's familiar Hiroshima welcomes us to the diner itself. That sense that the, the that central to the show's notion of food is bound to to memory, particularly the way that the taste of a particular dish transports you back to a former time. And we all know this feeling, right? That you have uh, something that you haven't had for years and years and years and you taste it and suddenly you're right back there. All right. And you can, you can feel it. You can smell what it was like in that particular place. And the way that we hanker after those kind of flavors from our past as a way of sort of stopping the passage of time, reconnecting us to who we were, right? holding on to things which are in some ways otherwise lost. And all of this sense of memory and, and the passing of time is anchored by the show's um, theme song, Omoide, which is performed by Tsunakichi Suzuki. Um, uh, and um, I'll say a little about this. And I should say, incidentally, that some of what I got, uh, the translation of the, of the lyrics of the song that I'm working from, comes from a, um, a site called Japanoscope, and Pete, who does the who does a sort of a lot of really uh, interesting discussions of Japanese language and culture, and, and uh, you should check those out. Um, and the, the song was originally a sort of 18th century folk song about a, a pretty milkmaid. It's not particularly interesting, but but in this sort of rewriting of the song, maybe I'll include a little snippet of it so you get a flavour of it. Twas on a bright morning in summer When I first heard his voice speaking low As he said to a calling beside him Who's that pretty girl milking? Her cow. So, I mean, it, it, it's kind of odd to hear it like that. And then, but um, in, in the rewriting of the song, the lyric obviously completely different. And but but it holds on to that sort of slight the the, the 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 poignancy which you can hear in the melody line, which the lyric then expands and makes central to the song and. Let me quickly read you a little bit of the of the lyric, translation of the lyric. So, see your pale breath floating over there as it slowly drifts off in the air. See it billow in the clouds in the sky and vanish before your eyes. See the white clouds reaching out there in the sky so far above the land, breathing in the air you breathed out, rolling on, rolling on. And do you remember the clouds streaming by above the river? And didn't they look just like this? Or maybe my mind plays tricks 
And do you remember the glaring sun and the dog sleeping there neath the eaves and all of these memories fade into the sky as they leave and so on, you know, and so it's about sort of looking back and trying to catch a moment and relive that moment. And there are a lot of different uh, versions. Of, the song, I think, has really sort of struck a chord with people. And there are a number of different um, cover versions on the internet. Uh, let me let me um, let me sh share with you one of my uh, favorite versions, which is this one by uh, Masumi Ako. I don't know how much of this I can include without violating copyright, but I'll give you a little taste and you can check it out. <laughs> isn't it? She slows it down, the voice is really nice, um, and you get to sort of feel the song. Though, I, 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 as I wrap this up, because I want to keep it short, um, I will leave you with this sort of heartbreaking live performance by Tsunakichi Suzuki, who, who wrote the song and performed it for the TV show, which was recorded shortly before his death in 2020 and it's and and i think the performance is loaded with what the song and the show is about the search for meaning and connection in a life which is defined by the passage of time and the way our lives are shaped by our sense of the past all we've seen all we've lost so this is tsunakichi suzuki performing Omoide.
And that's all I'm going to say. Uh, so check out Midnight Diner and Midnight Diner Tokyo Stories. It's on Netflix, at least in the U.S., um, and I think it's worth your time. It's You know, if you're interested in Japanese language and culture, it's also one of those opportunities that you have to hear people speaking real Japanese, not like anime Japanese. Um, and, uh, you know, the sub subtitles are good. It will help you sort of um, get used to the, the sound of the language and pick up certain phrases and stuff. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, so please, as ever, like, comment, subscribe, check out my Patreon page, check out one of my books, and um, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye.